the tough conversations in the world right now have a lot to do with our kids and that's why I brought my tea because when we have controversial, uh, awkward, tough questions to ask, it's always nice to have a teddy. Uh, it's always nice to have somebody to cuddle uh, and the people that we love to cuddle the most, uh, the little adults of our world, the, the little people that are gro going to grow up into big people, uh, what are we teaching them? What are we sharing with them about how the world works? And how do they know how to become respectful, kind, uh, critical thinkers? How do we teach our kids to think for themselves? And this is why this is such a controversial and uh, uncomfortable conversation. Uh, one, because I don't have any children. Uh, but two, I, I, I work with experience, invest time with other people's children every day. And I'm, I want our kids to grow up in a healthy, fit, strong world where they're mentally tough, mentally strong. Uh, they can do all the things that they want to do. There's no can't do it. There's just how can I do it? Uh, and the world's going to throw challenges at our kids. The world throws challenges at all of us every day. And doesn't matter which time in history you pick, uh, there's always been wars. There's always been droughts and floods and earthquakes and Mother Nature doing weird and wonderful things to the world because some, some of the things that Mother Nature does to our world is just wonderful. Uh, snow on the mountains and, and a, a, an amazing windy day or uh, some beautiful rain to make the grass green. They're all great things that Mother Nature does, but sometimes she gets really cranky and does horrible things and causes massive destruction to the world. Uh, and as an old lady, and obviously I'm a fit, strong, healthy person who I'm going to be young and strong for long, but I'm chronologically old. So it's easy for me, and if you're as old as me or, or older, we've seen and survived wars, droughts, floods, bushfires, hurricanes, earthquakes, a global financial crisis, uh, worldwide medical pandemics, and we've watched the world get fatter and sicker and weaker and more diseased in the 40 years that I've been an exercise professional. That's exactly what's happened to the world. Uh, we talk about a worldwide medical pandemic, but literally we have thousands, if not millions of people who die every year of some of the most horrible diseases that we actually have control over. If we were fit and healthy and strong and we were mentally tough, there's most of the diseases that we have now that kill us are the ones that we give to ourselves by mouth or by inactivity. So what's that got to do with our kids? What responsibility do we have as adults to make sure that our kids don't grow up in that world? where being sick and overweight and depressed and scared to death, literally scared to death of what could happen in the world. And I'm sharing this with you so passionately because I'm experiencing most days now children from as young as two or three uh, and in particular just right now conversations with teenagers who are Surely when you are a teenager, that is when you really need to focus on critical thinking, on thinking for yourself, on working it out for yourself. And the teenagers that I'm investing time with, uh, they have very little concept of the opposite side. They are hearing from mainstream media, they're hearing from social media, they're hearing from the government, they're hearing from uh, the newspaper and the radio, all these terrible things that are happening in the world, and they're scared, have you noticed? Uh, and I, I'm, I'm talking about other people's kids, so I can't imagine what it's like right now, to, right now in the world to be a parent. Where how do you explain to your, your kids when you've got insight and experience and, and you've lived through some horrible things that have happened in the world and survived, how do we explain to our kids that you can survive? And uh, I think that as adults we have a responsibility, don't you? We have a responsibility to give our kids uh, vision and hope and the ability to literally think for themselves. Uh, and I use the word hope very carefully because 
I'm not a fan of that word usually because to me it means that you're hoping, you don't know it's going to happen, but you're just hoping that it will. And the two examples I always use for hope, if you know, uh, people often hope to lose weight, but you don't actually lose weight unless you do something about it. A lot of people hope to be wealthy, so they buy a lottery ticket. But ultimately, if you want to be wealthy, you've got to put a financial plan into place and then follow that plan. And then regardless of your income, whether it's tiny or large, you can actually become financially free. But how do our kids know that? How do our kids know that there is a solution to every challenge? How do our kids know to think for themselves? And how do we teach them to think for themselves? And how do we, uh, if, if there's one... Uh, idea, one suggestion, one opinion, is it possible that there's an opposing opinion, idea, suggestion? Uh, and as an exercise professional, this has been profound for me. Uh, and again, I always use this example. There are top level cardiologists, professors of cardiology that suggest you should be a vegan vegetarian, you should be have a, or you should have a plant-based diet if you want to have a healthy heart. And there are professors of cardiology, with they're exactly the same degrees, with exactly the same number of years experience, and they will say you should be a carnivore. So you shouldn't eat any plant-based food at all, you should only eat the, the meat or the flesh or the fat from animals. And these guys argue with each other. Now, I, I don't want to get into the argument, but I'm a human being and I'm in the middle. I'm an exercise professional. What do I share with my clients? This cardiologist says plant-based and this cardiologist says be a, 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 a uh, carnivore. Uh, there's arguments, and I'll use exercise. Uh, you should exercise three times a week and include 150 minutes. Uh, there's neuroscientists who suggest if you really want to feel good on a regular basis, then you should be getting puffed three, four, five times a day. Now, there's a big difference between three times a week and three times a day, and then most of the population that doesn't exercise at all, and they will come up with lots of reasons and excuses perhaps as to why they don't exercise and they don't have time, and some of those people live a very long time and don't die. So how do we come up with... How do we teach our kids to think for ourselves? How do we come up with our own headspace to make sure that we're not getting led down somebody else's opinionated path? Uh, uh, this is I know that we know this, but do our kids know this? Regardless of how thin you slice something, there's always two sides. Uh, but our kids are being literally bombarded. If, and if you haven't uh, notice, please notice, <laughs> because I have because I have conversations with young adults, as I call them, uh, and perhaps more open because I'm not their parents, and they're sharing with me that they're scared of dying of a nuclear war, they're scared of dying of a virus, they're scared of dying from some kind of comorbidity because they've heard that a lot lately, uh, they're scared of dying in a flood, or they're scared of the world burning up with climate change. Because they're constantly bombarded with all this fear, 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 fear. And the challenge I've got, of course, with fear is if I'm scared of something, my body goes into stress. Now, stress is fantastic, as I always share, if you can fight or flight. If you can punch, if you can kick, and if you can run the hell away, uh, you'll, you'll de-stress. But if you don't punch, you don't kick, you don't fight, you don't lift heavy, you don't get rid of those neurotransmitters that produce high blood pressure, high heart rate, blood fats, blood sugars, then your body ends up in a state of dis-ease and you get sick. And our kids, one of the biggest stresses in the world is fear. And God forbid, and I'm, I just, uh, this is really challenging for me, uh, if you turn on any news story, and it's a, just an interesting observation, uh, at our house, we don't watch the news and we just don't do it because it's very difficult uh, to uh, keep positivity and happiness in your life if you put that kind of negativity into your life. In the defense of the news companies, they have a job to do. They have to make money and it seems that the human race is not interested in information that's positive and happy. Have you noticed? <laughs> uh, there have been some, some news organizations that try to just... And I won't say they tried to produce happy news. They just tried to put a more positive spin on the news. And, of course, that didn't work. So we don't watch the news at our house. 
and we haven't listened to the radio for, in fact, I can't remember the last time I listened to the radio uh, because I don't want to get other people's opinions. I want to work it out for myself. But uh, at the moment, we're renting in a suburban area while we're waiting to build our home. And we're in a brand new suburb and every block around us, every section, everywhere you look, there's a new house being built, which means there's builders there, workmen, tradesmen every day. And I don't know if you've noticed, but tradesmen have the radio on all day. And I'm now I have to, luckily I've got really good insulated house. I'm very happy to close the windows and lock that out. But it, it makes complete sense to me, and I'm gonna ask you this question. If you do listen to the radio, maybe you listen to it subconsciously. So you, you think, oh, I'm not taking that information in, it's just noise in the background. But interestingly, there's, you, that's not how the brain works. We take everything in, yeah, even if it's subconsciously. But if you consciously listen to the radio now and listen to the words that are being used, uh, the way things are described, whether it's a, a flood, a drought, a hurricane, a cyclone, a tsunami, a medical pandemic, doesn't matter. Have a listen to the words that are being used. And that's why I block that stuff out because here's me, the woman who loves adjectives. I say amazing and awesome and fantastic and brilliant and superb all the time. I love those words. But when you look at negative adjectives, horrendous, tragic, serious, uh, crazy, uh, scary, there's a whole heap of adjectives to describe an experience uh, that create panic, that create dis-ease, that create fear. And is it possible that our kids are being bombarded with that every single day, particularly with the radio? Now, I'm, I'm, all I'm asking from my heart to yours is what is the future for our kids? Uh, if we've got teenagers who are scared of dying in a war, scared of dying in, in, a, in the, the, the world burning up from climate change, they're scared of dying of a virus, uh, they're scared of what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, I, I asked this question, and this is just an experience that's just happened to me. Uh, as, as I always share, uh, I'm an ultimate optimist, but we're all going to die, <laughs> every single one of us. We don't know how long we're here for. Now, we could die tomorrow, and we could die when we're 150. The longevity experts are aiming for us to live a really long time. But today I had an example. Uh, there were some workmen uh, working with a, a, a big piece of machinery, and it had a, a big, it was a digger and had a big scooper on the end. And the scooper was high up in the air. And in the bucket of the scooper was a big, heavy piece of metal. And I was in my garden. And all of a sudden, I kind of felt wind go past my, my head. So natural instinct, when your body's under stress, you either fight or flight. Now, I didn't think I needed to fight at the time, so I flighted. I very quickly jumped out of the way. Lucky with my fit, strong body, I've got fast twitch muscle fibers. And... I wouldn't call it a near-death experience, but if I had stayed in the spot that I was in, very likely that that very heavy piece of metal would have fallen on my head and I would have died. Because I went to help the guy move that thing that had fallen on the ground, that piece of metal, and I couldn't move it. Now I'm pretty strong. The two of us together couldn't move it. He had to pick it back up with a digger. So I could have died. Uh, this is a great headline, isn't it? A woman dies of digger, a big piece of metal falling out of a digger. And I'm sharing that passionately because I don't know when I'm going to die. I just know that I want to live without fear, without stress, and without being bombarded with other people's opinions. And everybody's got a right to their own opinion. I get that. But the challenge we've got is we seem to be living in a world where if you don't have this opinion, this exact opinion that seems to be the normal, uh, what's on the news or what's on the radio, and, and those, those two seem to go together. And this is the question I ask, and I'm going to be very conspiratorial, but let's, uh, let me ask you this question. There's outright lies, I call it cow poo. There's outright bullshit, yeah? Then there's opinions... Uh, no, there's probably one in, the, in between. There's outright lies. There's what people would call a conspiracy theory. And I'm not even sure what that means. It just means that uh, somebody's conspiring against us. I don't know. But there's that thing that people don't know. Don't, that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, then we have, it seems to be opinion. Uh, and then we have perhaps uh, belief. 
And then we have conviction. And it's interesting because wars are literally fought over conviction. People die for their convictions. Uh, an opinion perhaps can be changed, but once that opinion becomes a belief and then becomes a conviction, I'm not sure that that can be changed. At our house, we always call that uh, concrete, that solid concrete. If I've still got cement spinning around in a cement truck, there's some ideas that can be changed, and maybe that's opinion, because that cement truck, cement, wet cement, can be turned into lots of different things. I can turn it into a bridge or a road or a building or a brick or a statue. But once it's become set concrete, very difficult to change that. And it seems that our kids are given a lot of concrete and they are told, this is what you have to believe. Uh, my father, and I'm so grateful for this, taught me from as little, as little as I can remember that there has to be a why and how doesn't matter what somebody tells you and doesn't matter how sincerely, passionately they tell you that information, they could be sincerely, passionately wrong. Would that be a fair statement? Is it possible that the carnivore, carnivore believes that they're right, the carnivore cardiologists and the plant-based cardiologists absolutely, passionately, sincerely believe that they're right? But what's going to be right for you? And do you have to work it out for yourself? See, there are some people that don't eat meat because they love animals. There are some people that don't eat meat for religious reasons. And I always share that. I was brought up in an interesting environment where a lot of the people that in my religion believe that if you ate meat, you didn't go to heaven, particularly some kinds of meat. So which is right? These guys absolutely, passionately, sincerely believe that you should be a carnivore and these ones absolutely, passionately believe that you should be have a plant-based diet. So what do you need to do? And if I'm, a, if I'm a child, if I'm a teenager and I'm presented with two experts, which one should I believe? But isn't the, the important part of that that I've got two experts? Opposing points of view, discussion, debate, argument, I'm not sure, because I asked today, do we still have debating at school? And the young man who's 15 who I asked that question, he looked at me as if to say, what are you talking about? I said, you know, debating where you have two teams and they, uh, they're given an argument and one side has to prove one point and one has to prove the other point. He said, no, we don't do that at my school. Uh, he's in, in senior high school and he's, he didn't know what debating was. How do we learn to think differently, think openly? How do we learn to think for ourselves if we're not given both sides of the story? Or do we need to go and find the other side of the story? And it doesn't mean that the other side's right. Uh, you could have an argument. If you, if you believe people should eat meat and these people believe that you shouldn't, that could be a good argument. But at least let's at least listen to the argument. Let's listen to both sides and make up our own mind. Uh, and that's what I'm asking. Uh, there's, there's been many wars in the world. I'm very privileged that I, have, I had a fair bit to do with the Second World War because that's what my parents went through. I obviously didn't live through it, but they did. But since then, there's been some really interesting, horrible, terrible wars happen in the world. I remember being about 18 or 19 and the first Iraq war, war where America went in. And uh, I remember looking up at the sky thinking, I think bombs are going to fall on me. I was, you know, just, I was still a teenager and I didn't know. I didn't know what happened. All I had was the terrible stories from my parents' experience with war. So I didn't know that bombs weren't going to fall on me in country New South Wales in Australia. And that's exactly what I experienced today with the teenagers who are living today. They're really scared that there's going to be a war that kills them. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's not true. I don't know. I'm not going to pretend I know whether there's going to be a world war or not. But I don't want our kids to think that that's the only option. And I did ask this question today. Uh, is it possible that there are a lot of wars that have been... Uh, held off that didn't happen because of diplomacy because there was somebody who could look at both sides of the story look at this opinion and look at this opinion and look for a win-win uh, there's a great book called the seven habits of highly effective people and one of those habits is to seek first to understand which means listen to the other side of the story yeah 
And then win, win or no deal, which means you have to win and you have to win, otherwise there's no deal. If this person wins and this person loses, well, that's not fair. If this person wins and that person loses, that's not fair. If you're going to come and buy my house, I need to get the win deal for that house because I'm selling you my house. But you need to feel like you've won because you've bought the house that you want to buy. You can't walk away feeling that I ripped you off, but I can't walk away feeling that you ripped me off because that's where we have challenges. So as I ask the question today, how uh, valuable is the person that can look at both sides of every story, look at the, the pros and cons of this side and the pros and cons of this side and work out that this could be the best way to get through this? Uh, the diplomats of the world, the people that can think with democratic minds, that can think how can both sides get walk away from this feeling like they've won and nobody loses, uh, how, can we, how can we get great diplomacy? How can we get great democracy? How can we even have somebody who can be responsible for that role if we don't teach our young adults how to think for themselves? So very controversially, our kids are bombarded with climate change is going to kill us, nuclear war is going to kill us, a medical pandemic is going to kill us. They've got these kids that have got no re point of reference because if you're, if you're a 15-year-old, for example, that I spoke to today, the 15-year-olds, they've from 13 to 15, they've just had fear every day. They've had deaths, 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 deaths every day. So they don't know that the, the world has got terrible things happening all the time. I want to give you another example of that if you're as old as me. Uh, the news used to be reported, used to be half an hour uh, one time of the night. Uh, there was no 24-hour news channels. There was just one half an hour news report. Uh, it was reported directly into the camera, usually, well, for as long as I can remember as it growing up, was a man in a suit with no emotion, no adjectives and no emotion. And he would just talk to the world and say, today, this happened. And he would talk about bushfires, floods, mudslides, car accidents, murders, earthquakes, medical pandemics, and he'll just report it without any emotion. So there was a lot less, uh, a lot less fear produced because it was never delivered with fear and it wasn't delivered with horrendous or, or uh, dramatic or horrible pre-words. It was just, this happened. Not this terrible thing happened, just this happened. Not this horrific thing happened, just this happened. Uh, and if you're interested in what happened, you, know, you couldn't Google because there wasn't Google and you, 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 there was a newspaper and there was a couple of radio stations and a couple of television stations and that was it, that was it for the news. But now the news people have 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. And if they want to make money, they have to produce stuff that people are going to watch. And sadly, of course, have you noticed, uh, what kind of things do we like to watch? It seems that as humans, we're not particularly interested in happy stories about teddy bears and animals and people doing nice things. That's usually the one minute story at the end of the news <laughs> and the rest of the news is car accidents and murders and wars and and medical challenges and all the terrible things that are going on in the world and they throw that at the world at six o'clock at night and wonder why our kids are scared so could we give our kids our future adults some tools to learn how to think for themselves should we give them the opportunity regardless of what our beliefs are Regardless if we've been brought up with a certain political persuasion, do we say, you have to vote this way? Or do we take our young adults through the process of, these are the policies of this party, and these are the policies of this party. This is how, this is what these people believe. This is what these people believe. What do you think? What would you like to eat? This group of people say that you should eat plant-based food for these reasons. These people say that you should eat meat for these reasons. And there's plenty of people in the middle. What do you think? What do you think is going to work best for you? There's a, a, a talking or there's talk of a war or there's a war happening in a foreign land many thousands of miles away. Uh, this person says that the war started for this reason. And this person says that the war started for this reason. What do you think? 
could we come up with some analogies? Could we ask our kids to say, okay, if you were the boss of this country, what would you do? If you were the boss of this country, if you're the president or the prime minister of that country, what would you do? Uh, is it possible that the news that we're hearing every day isn't giving us all of the all of the, the story? So maybe we need to have a look at. And I'll just use again this as an example: uh, the Max International Business College and the Max International Fitness College has students all over the world. Right now, eighteen different countries. So it's really interesting that the news delivered in this country is often not the same as this country and completely opposite to this one. Or there might be three or four delivering exactly the same script. And I always ask the question, how they come there's four countries with four different prime ministers or presidents and they're all saying exactly the same words and then there's four or five countries over here that are saying completely different words and then there's people in the middle that are using a combination of those words. I wonder what the real story is. I'm going to think about that for myself rather than listen to everything that's given to me via a particular news story or a, a particular news channel. And I'm going to ask the question again, is it possible that the news that we are delivered on a day-to-day -day basis could have opinion attached to it, could have an agenda attached to it, could have financial concern attached to it, uh, and the person delivering the news now, do they have an opinion? And if you, if you do watch the news, maybe perhaps listen out if you haven't already. Uh, is it possible that the news is often delivered with the opinion of the person delivering the news? Uh, as I shared when I was growing up, that never happened. <laughs> it was just, this is what happened. And it was, a, it was just a, a monotone voice. Now it's a fair bit of drama <laughs> and a fair few adjectives and a fair bit of opinion uh, on something that may or may not have happened. And the reason I share that with you is I often get from this country that where the thing actually happened, they tell one story, and then there's another country that says, well, did, Ro, did you hear what happened in that country? And I go, no, tell me about that. And they go, rah, rah, rah. But the person that's living in that country actually told me a completely different story. And then someone from this side of the world says, Ro, did you hear what happened in that country? And it's completely opposing to that person's opinion or ideas or, or Chinese whispers, whatever you want to call it, which is completely different to what the person living in that country actually is experiencing at the moment. Now, I don't know which is right or wrong. What I do know, and I'm sure that you do too, is it doesn't matter how thin you slice it, there's always two sides. Is it possible that people see things from a different angle? I'll use another example. Uh, ask the police uh, how uh, reliable an eyewitness is to a crime. Uh, there's so many examples of, so what did you see? Uh, there was a man and he had brown hair and the other person says, no, he had blonde hair. There was a man and he was wearing a blue jacket. No, he was wearing a green jacket. There was a grey car. No, it was a blue car. Uh, so there's a lot of um, defence attorneys who take full advantage of the fact that eyewitnesses are not very reliable because what people see, and it's not that they're wrong, they just saw it from a different angle, they saw it with a different headspace, they saw it with a different heart, with a different opinion. And isn't that awesome that we all get the right to do that? But our kids, how do they learn to think for themselves? How do we teach them that there's two sides to every story? How do we make sure that they are interested in both sides? If you're brought up in a strict religion, you'll probably believe that religion because that's what you're brought up with. But are there other religions and do those people believe something different and they were brought up that way? How about we find out why? One of those great questions, why do you believe that? Why is it important to you? Why do you believe that? Why is it important to you? And go back to that beautiful rule, seek first to understand before you seek to be understood. So if you really think that your political opinion or your religious opinion or your idea about world war or your idea about a medical pandemic is the most important, why don't we listen to the other side of the story? Uh, there's a lot of people who've been asking me for the last several years now, Rowie, what religious beliefs do you have and what medical beliefs do you have and what do you think about the state of the, of the American politics because I travel a lot. Uh, I'm not interested in sharing my opinion I sh and I, the reason is there's two reasons. One is I don't want to get into an argument. I'm not interested in arguments and I don't want to change somebody else's mind because I get that other people have the right to have an opinion. But the second reason is if I'm sharing my opinion... All I'm going to do now is create an argument 
and I'm not going to learn anything. How will our kids learn anything if they've only got one idea in their head and then they argue that idea? Regardless of my religious beliefs, I'm very interested in every other person I meet that wants to share their religious beliefs with me. I think it's awesome. Regardless of my political beliefs, I love it when people share their political beliefs with me. Usually, I appreciate it more in this tone than, you should be. <laughs> if you don't do this, you won't go to heaven. If you don't vote this way, the country's going to go to shit. Well, I appreciate passion as well. But isn't it nice to have a conversation with somebody where you can have opposing opinions? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting excited now. Because wouldn't this be an awesome world? I have to remember to breathe. <coughs> Excuse me. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where you and I could share, share opposing opinions and still walk away being respectful of each other and each other's opinions? Wouldn't it be nice if we could walk away from each other and say, okay, we're going to agree to disagree. See, that's called win-win or no deal. We either agree or we disagree, but agree that that's, that that's okay, that we have opposing opinions. We don't have to agree with each other. I think it's... Um, I think it's really nasty and rude and disrespectful, but this is now my opinion. <laughs> uh, if I treat somebody differently because they have a different opinion to me, if I, uh, if I treat somebody less than important because they have a different religious belief to me or a medical belief to me, uh, I think that's something that I wouldn't want our kids to be doing when they become adults. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a bit more diplomacy and a bit more democracy and a bit more critical thinking and a bit more open thinking? And I don't know about you, but I've been wrong many times in my life. And one of the things I really appreciate is finding out that I'm wrong, admitting that I'm wrong. That's a, I, I love it. I go, I was wrong. <laughs> in fact, I often share this with people. Please prove me wrong. I would love this, whatever this thing is inside my head, I would love to be wrong. Prove me wrong. I want to be wrong. And is it possible that if we're talking, all we're hearing is our own opinion and we're not learning anything? So if we're open to listening and open to learning and then open to a win-win or no deal, I want you to feel good and I want to feel good. And until that happens, we're going to keep talking. Last but not least, the most beautiful form of communication that's ever been shared with me is a gift. I don't understand, but I want to. If I say to somebody, I understand how you feel, or you don't understand, I've got, I'm going to have an, create an argument, or I'm going to have an argument, it means I'm in one. But instead of I understand, which I never can, because if I've never been in that other person's, I've never been that other person, so I can't understand. But I want to, because I care about people, and I want to know what makes people tick. So please tell me, I don't understand where you're coming from. Or I don't understand because I'm a woman and you're a man. I don't understand because I was born in this country and you're born in that country. I don't understand because I was brought up this way and you're brought up another way. I don't understand, but I want to. So please explain. Which means we may not get into an argument. And if I tell somebody, this is what you should think. This is what you should do. Is it possible that I'm sharing what I know, but I can't learn anything else? So rather than saying, I understand, how about this? I don't understand, but I want to. Why do you believe that? Why is that important to you? How does it add value to your life? Three very special questions. And what if we ask those questions more often? Could they help our young adults to be better critical thinkers? Why is that important to you? Why do you believe that? And how does it add value to your life? Maybe there are three questions that we should ask ourselves about every opinion that we have. I often ask that about people who talk to me about food and exercise. Why do you believe that? Where did that come from? Do you want to be the regurgitator of somebody else's opinion? Do you want to become the expert in somebody else's opinion? Or do you want to listen to both sides and make sure that you've got all the information, not just half of it? And do we need to do that for our kids? Could that be a great question?